Hi, everybody. Welcome to Money Matters, Changing the Story of Poverty, Prosperity, and Opportunity. I'm Kate Fulb. I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, which is a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. And it's a place where we place a premium on the importance of storytelling. And we especially value the master storytellers of the entertainment industry, all of you. So Hollywood Health and Society hosts these panels often in partnership with the Writers Guild to give screenwriters the chance to hear from experts on a variety of health, safety, and security topics. Tonight, we have an additional treat because we're going to get a preview of some new research by the Norman Lear Center and by Harmony Labs, which like this event is supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I learned just the other day that one in about six kids in America lives in poverty, in the richest country in the world. Poverty is right here. It's not across the ocean in some far off land, it's right here. And I'm sure if you drive around LA or New York or wherever you are, you'll see it. But do we have an accurate understanding of poverty in America? Do we really? And how can entertainment help us gain that understanding? Well, today we're gonna find out. But before I introduce our moderator, I wanna show you a quick video montage to set the stage for our discussion and see how many shows and videos you can identify in the meantime. Go ahead and roll the tape. Hey, 40 on two. Okay, well, well, we'll quiz you later on how many videos or how many shows you could identify. But I wanna get right to the discussion. So now to our moderator. He is the incoming president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston, where he begins in a few weeks, maybe in a week in April. But for the last decade or more, he served as the executive director of corporate social responsibility for Walt Disney Television, where he led 
all pro-social and philanthropic efforts, including issues of representation, diversity, equity, inclusion, and pro-social script integration. So you can imagine we work together a lot. You can read David's full bio in the chat along with other panelists' bios, but suffice it to say, he is a brilliant, accomplished mensch whom I will miss working with on a regular basis, but also someone I am honored to call my friend. Please welcome David Ambrose. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go with Mensch um, and I, you're not getting rid of me. I think this is such a important topic and I wanna to get to the conversation. I wanna share just a little bit why I said yes to this panel. Um, my family and um, so many other kids in Los Angeles lived in homelessness for 11 years. We lived in New York City and Boston and other cities and towns where we uh, participated in many of the activities you saw in that, that sizzle reel. And when this conversation came up, I was so passionate uh, to, to be part of it because I think too often we engage in, in poverty porn and we don't really tease out the issues that are affecting and afflicting and oppressing. So I couldn't be more excited to facilitate this uh, is so meaningful to me. Um, and I, I think after today, everything's gonna be fixed and we're gonna have more fair and accurate representation, to sure of it. Um, first, I want to introduce uh, Erica Rosenthal from the Norman Lear Center. Um, the Lear Center is director of research. She's gonna preview some findings on the dominant narrative and scripted entertainment, the importance of addressing the intersections of race and class and the ways in which popular sitcoms may unintentionally convey stereotypes about those struggling financially. So with that um, rather daunting introduction, I'll turn it over to Erica. Thank you so much, David. Good afternoon or evening, everyone, wherever you are. I'm excited to be here with you today. And I'm going to share my screen now. Our Norman Lear Center research on poverty narratives included a variety of different activities, which you can learn more about on our website at mediaimpactproject.org slash poverty. But today I'm gonna to be sharing some key themes and previewing some brand new findings that emerged from the final phase, phase of our research, looking at poverty narratives in scripted entertainment. So first, our research and that of others has consistently shown that the dominant narrative in popular entertainment is one of individualism and particularly of meritocracy, success achieved through hard work. Zeynep Tufeki published a piece in 2019 highlighting the differences between what she calls sociological and psychological storytelling, noting that how we tell our stories has great consequences for how we deal with the problems in our world. Emotional stories are traditionally psychological in nature. They focus on individuals. On the other hand, sociological stories address the institutions, the systems, and the structures in which individuals are embedded. So to understand the balance between sociological and psychological storytelling, we analyzed 72 scripted TV episodes and films from the last five years that address poverty in some way. We found this content is more likely to illustrate concepts and solutions that help one individual or sometimes a handful than systemic concepts and solutions that address the root cause of the financial challenge. These individual solutions include things like committing crime or donations to charity. Another study we conducted found that even when systemic causes are acknowledged, presenting individual level solutions like charity can actually undermine support for equity-based policies. Second, our research noted the importance of illustrating the hidden hardships that affect a character's ability to succeed. In particular, the ways in which race contribute to economic inequality, even beyond class, but also in ways that are intertwined with class. Sometimes called a race class narrative, this approach involves explicitly naming race and calling out the use of racially divisive tactics. In our research on poverty in scripted TV and film, we looked at four different types of financial challenges that we saw, uh, job, housing, health, and food, and how they intersected with race. We found that characters facing job or housing-related challenges are more likely to be white, in fact, nearly half of them. 
On the other hand, characters facing health or food related challenges are more likely to be black. Again, nearly half. We also found that female characters experienced more health related uh, financial challenges than, than did male characters, almost by a ratio of two to one. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, just something to be conscious of. Third, we found that popular sitcoms can inadvertently convey stereotypes about people living in poverty. Existing research shows that the poor are often perceived as unfriendly, incompetent, or lazy. So to determine whether entertainment is contributing to these perceptions, we identified 20 popular sitcoms and divided them into two groups based on the main character's socioeconomic status, or SES. Then we examined the behaviors of the five main characters in four randomly selected episodes from each of these 20 shows. Characters in the higher SES sitcoms are in fact portrayed as warmer. Specifically, they engage in more laughing and hugging, which are indicative of warmth. But lower SES characters are actually more likely to share meals together. To measure competence, we analyzed episode transcripts using a linguistic analysis tool. Characters in higher SES sitcoms are, are portrayed as more competent based on larger vocabulary, as well as greater use of correct grammar. We didn't see any differences between the two groups in terms of laziness. Now, I'm not suggesting that these were conscious decisions by the writers of these shows, but stereotypical narratives can sometimes be unconsciously and implicitly embedded in the dialogue and the behaviors that are attributed to fictional characters. Finally, scripted TV does have the potential to challenge the dominant narrative of individualism. There are many examples of TV characters over the years who push back against labor violations. So many, in fact, that we were able to generate a supercut of characters being mocked or dismissed as Norma Ray. Storytellers can push back by portraying collective action, boycotting, marching, protesting, striking, or picketing as a viable solution to address structural barriers, and particularly by showing how such tactics can actually succeed. In our research, we saw numerous examples of characters engaged in collective action, including in some of the shows represented by our panelists tonight, including Pose and Hentified. Ultimately, the challenge I would pose to writers who seek to change the narrative around issues of injustice and inequity is how do you make stories about systems emotionally compelling? How do you balance giving your characters agency with the need to address uh, institutional and systemic barriers. I'd like to thank the Norman Lear Center's research team, as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which supported this research. You can visit our website below at mediaimpactproject.org poverty to read more about this research. Uh, be sure to check out our Norma Ray Supercut and our Spotify playlist of songs about poverty and wealth. Now I will hand it over back to David. Thank you. You had me at Norma Ray. I think um, we may have to update the reference for a younger generation, but a uh, huge fan. Um, I, I, just to keep us on track, I wanna ask just one question and then perhaps come back to it in the discussion with the panel and the, and the uh, audience. Um, we have content creators both on the panel and dialing in today. And, how can, how can they and we collectively more effectively address the intersections you kind of noted between race and class? Are there good examples you can point towards that we, um, we should, if not model, at least be aware of? Um, yeah, go ahead. That's, a, that's a great question. So I, I mentioned the race class narrative, which is uh, something that has been developed and studied by, by Demos and others. Um, and the research has shown that, that messages using this narrative, so, explicitly uh, drawing attention to race, not trying to paper over it and linking race with economic inequality um, are more effective at, at changing people's minds about poverty related issues um, 
than kind of the more traditional race neutral narratives of poverty. So there's a number of, of elements of the race class narrative. It's discussing race overtly, and it's not something that belongs to other people. Race mm -hmm. applies to everyone. Um, it, it names the use of racial scapegoating as something that, that harms all of us. It emphasizes unity and, and collective action and um, you know cross-racial solidarity. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the government really needs to work for, for all of us. So uh, one example that, that I thought was great that we um, discussed in our, our research was from Little Fires Everywhere. Um, so there's, it's, it involves two mothers, black mother Mia played by Kerry Washington and an upper class uh, white mother named Elena played by Reese Witherspoon. And um, there's a great scene where, where uh, Mia confronts Elena about the concept of individual choice and in economic outcomes. She tells her, you didn't make good choices, you had good choices. And when Elena says that she thought they were friends, Mia snaps back, white women always want to be friends with their maid. Mm -hmm. And th I thought that was such a great line that really you know, brings race to the forefront. And the book, the best-selling book on which this TV series was based, they didn't actually identify the, the race of the lead characters. Mm -hmm. So the show's creators made an explicit decision here to, mm -hmm. to make this, this story that was already about class disparities, also about race and tie those issues in together. That's a great example. And it also brings in gender, which I, I hope we get to more in the Q&A uh, section. Um, thank you. I want to keep us on track and also kind of expand the conversation to additional research. Um, next, Harmony Labs Director of Data Science, Ricky uh, Cor Conray, excuse me, will talk about the key audience they've identified through the research called, and I love this, Tough Cookies and the narratives that resonate with this audience. Based on this research, um, she'll propose a potential new narrative to change the hearts and minds of these tough cookies. Um, and I am really uh, inclined because you have, my goodness, you have my icon on there. So please go right ahead and uh, tell us why. Why, why Dolly? Well, because Dolly is everything, but, I only have five minutes. So in five minutes, all I can really do is inspire you. I'm going to give you a little taste. And that taste is Eric started us off with how creators can put story elements into their stories that move people on poverty. And I'm going to do a little bit the opposite. I'm going to talk about how we read the stories that audiences choose to understand the world they want and the world that they think they're living in. This is super important because I used to work for a decade or so in policy and then politics and advocacy and researchers in that space are asked all the time, what can I say? How can I frame this? How can I build a policy that really works for this group? What's important to them? What do they care about? And when you do research in that space, you do some surveys and some focus groups and people are really good at telling you what the problem is. So Tough Cookies, the audience I'm going to talk about today, does understand that there is a systemic source of poverty here in the United States. And they understand that they would like that to stop being the case, but they don't have such a good handle on what the world is that they want to see. That's because people are really bad at self-reporting what the world is that they want to see, but they're really good at reporting it to us with their remote controls. So one of the reasons I picked Tough Cookies today is that you can look and we do at all of the cultural content that people consume across all kinds of spaces, but I wanted to look at TV and Tough Cookies is a deep TV audience. I'm going to talk a little about scripted and a little about reality, but first I want to talk about news. Because if you want to understand a tough cookie and build a world that works for them, for the economy that they envision when this is all better, you got to know that the world is a dangerous place for a tough cookie. They consume twice as much news as anyone else, and it tends to be really local and pretty dark. So when they're in their happy place in music and on TV, there's a lot of cozy, easy listening, references to home, and this is super important, a lot of social order and rules. I have no idea why. Oh, I'm sorry. I just accidentally brought up a clip from this really cool slide. There we go. Their most important scripted television shows, the ones that have the highest reach in this group are 
police procedurals. And procedural here is really operative. If you are a partner of mine, an advocate uh, or an organizer or a policymaker, you gotta know that having a set of rules for this audience that they can follow to make themselves and their families safe is super important. And that's reflected in their story choice. Uh, it's also why I love police procedurals because I do love a cozy ending to a problem. You can also use their TV choice, though, to understand the, ec the economic reality they think they're living in. These are all of the TV shows that over-indexed for this group in December and also had any mention not just of poverty, but of economic opportunity or even how we're going to get to tomorrow. By layering story on story on story, an audience creates a narrative. No individual creator goes in thinking, I'm going to put in some story elements and I'm going to have this be about poverty in this particular way. Instead, Tough Cookies write that story for themselves through their story choice. And a lot of that is illuminated through their reality choices. So when we're talking again to those advocates and organizers, here's the story pattern that this audience resonates with, the one that they see themselves in, the world they inhabit. And their storyscape involves labor. Like Erica said, lots of very individual labor, very hard jobs, very dirty jobs. But these jobs don't typically lead in a progressive fashion through effort to making good or ascending. Instead, these shows tend to feature magic or miracle. So in, in American Pickers, you find that magical piece of junk. You literally strike gold in Gold Rush. The core narrative that Tough Cookies are constructing for themselves that represents the world they currently inhabit is you keep going and you hope for better. A sense of wonder is really great. But a miracle is not a solution, and this audience is seeking a solution. So what can we learn from the TV programs this audience chooses about what that solution could look like if we just pivoted away from miracles and talked a little bit about what a collective solution to poverty would look like? We can use the data to tell us something about this too. And here, I'm not going to be able to conclude for sure that a thing is true, but I am going to be able to supply my advocate and organizer and policymaker partners with hypotheses they can test that are grounded in the worlds that people want to see because they're the worlds that people choose themselves to spend time in. And that world, when we look at this bridging zone, this is a storyscape not at the center of Tough Cookies, but close to Tough Cookies. It neighbors tough cookies, but it overlaps with people power. You get to look this all up on the website in a second, but people power is us. People power is an audience invested in systemic solutions to this systemic problem. And that means that the stories that appear here that bring us and tough cookies together represent that, that rich hypothesis zone for the world that tough cookies could want to see if we had more than just waiting for a miracle. And you see again, themes of wonder and Dolly. Dolly pops literally every time I do an analysis on this group. Christmas, and this was December, but it's not just Christmas. It's all holidays and all celebrations and a real sense of angels among us and home, of course, a major theme. That's why when we think about the world that will resonate with Tough Cookies when we go to them with a $15 minimum wage, for instance, it's not a fight for 15. It's a miracle at 15. And this image comes from one of the many towns that applied to be on hometown takeover this year. Hometown represents a really good, rich storytelling zone for this audience, because not only does it feature home improvement, which of course is the lifeblood of my pandemic, but also it doesn't just center flipping a home for an investment, it centers flipping a community for a reinvestment. This kind of hypothesis generation directly from audience isn't exclusively so that we can get something right and make a sale. It's so that we can understand and envision the world that these audiences want to inhabit, choose to inhabit in their story lives. And we can bring those to fruition and bring those to the audiences with the policies that we create. Tough Cookies though is a very different audience from say, if you say so. So if you wanna learn about the lived cultural experience of some of the other audiences who are eager for a new American economy, you can go to obaudiences.org, take the quiz and learn that you're all people power. And uh, you can also just check out our website at Harmony Labs. But OB Audiences tells you a lot about the rich cultural lives of all four of these core audiences. Thank you. And um, 
Just fascinating. And I think, you know, I've heard a lot of the shows that you've described in that category as almost a, a palliative that people have used to get through some rougher times. It was interesting to see a lot of them represented in that the category. And I have a couple of questions for you, but I want to I want to put those maybe in the panel discussion and have you weigh in as the conversation kind of probably goes over some of the same topics. Um, I want to um, ask uh, my entertainment panel now to come online and share a, a few thoughts. And I have a couple questions and I know that Ricky and Eric will be part of that conversation as well. And I have, uh, I want them in the mix. So with that, I wanna introduce our entertainment panel. Uh, we have Steven Canales from Pose. I'm sure uh, tons of fans here like myself. Uh, Linda Yvette Chavez from Hentified. Um, uh, we also have Marvin Lemus from Hentified as well. Erica Green Swafford from New Amsterdam and Anthony Sparks from Green Sugar. Um, hello everybody. And the amazing bios of these folks are gonna be in the chat discussion area. So I'm gonna carve more out time for our conversation today. Um, hello everybody. And, and thank you for, for joining and sharing both, I think your personal narrative as well as uh, the stories you tell. And I wanna start off with a question really for everyone that, uh, that's on the panel to have the chance to weigh in as they see. Um, I think all the shows that you represent shine a light on a struggle that people face in making ends meet um, and the systems that are in place that maintain the barriers for these communities. When you tell these stories, I wonder if you could talk about, is this an intent that you set out with to tell that or was it a byproduct of the shows and the character stories as you develop them? And I, I'm throwing that open to the panel here and we'll, we'll see where that goes. With regard to New Amsterdam, it was baked in to the creation of the show. Uh, it's based on the first public hospital in the country that was founded in the 1780s. Uh, and uh, the systemic issues that um, uh, exacerbate healthcare in this country are astonishing. And so on a weekly basis, we try and tackle things sometimes in a personal context in terms of the storytelling, but uh, highlighting the set it and forget it of our system uh, that keeps people continually in a, a, a problematic situation, whether or not it's redlining, whether or not it's racism compounding other uh, like health factors for black and brown people. So it's a thing that we think about and was in, the, in our first conversation in the show. Yeah, and for those not familiar with redlining, do you wanna just give a quick? Sure, um, it was the US government uh, in the 1940s uh, started uh, actually taking a red line in areas that had large swaths of African-American populations made it so that people in those areas were not going to qualify for loans. So even though there are a large amount of African-Americans who participated in World War II uh, and had access to the GI Bill like other people, um, they were unable to get home loans. Right. And that is one of those ways that you could do wealth transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, so huge, huge amounts of people were unable to buy homes, build wealth and pass it mm -hmm. on. And so there's like this lack of intergenerational wealth as a result. I think it's really interesting because today we're, we're, as you said, set it and forget it. We're like, well, there's not redlining today, but, you know, having 75 or whatever, it's been 80 years of uh, um, stopping of the progress of passing through wealth and accumulating has a repercussion. I think it's a really interesting topic. And I don't know if our friends from Hentify want to weigh in there, but I, I would throw that question again. Um, how has this topic come up? Has it been intentional? And I would love to hear from anyone else. Um, I'll jump in. Hey, uh, this is Anthony from Queen Sugar. And Queen Sugar is a family drama, uh, but it is a, a decidedly, uh, affirmatively Black family drama that's set in rural Louisiana and in New Orleans. And it is about a sugarcane farm. So it is about Black farmers who happen to be in the news, the fight for equity, um, financial equity, or, or some sort of financial justice for Black farmers has recently been in the news quite a bit as the bill that President Biden just signed, uh, I believe, provides for uh, some 
attempt at, uh, uh, at uh, financial uh, justice for black farmers. So Queen Sugar is a show that it's baked into the cake, the question that you're, that, that you're talking about, because while it looks like a family drama, what the show um, really is, is also, since it's about black farmers, it's about generational struggle and it's about the systemic uh, uh, prejudice and discrimination that has uh, pushed on black farmers for the last 100 years, such that I believe the numbers are roughly that black farmers used to be 14% of farmers in this country. Uh, now they are, I believe, a little less than 1% uh, over the course of, of, of 100 years. And so economic pressure is baked into the cake uh, of our show, the foundation of our show. Uh, these farmers uh, uh, and, and the citizens of our fictional town, St. Joe, are constantly dealing with, if not living check to check, they certainly live season to season. Mm -hmm. And the way that farming works where you have to take out farming loans in right. order to get your money to do, to do your planting, and then your harvest is what allows you to pay off that loan. And the systemic issues that are a part of Black farmers receiving less money for their land, um, uh, you know, foreclosing on farms that are in trouble um, uh, much more quickly. It, 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 it really um, goes very, very deep, almost to the point that if you don't know the story about the struggles of, of uh, the financial struggles of black farmers, when you hear about it and you hear about the predatory um, uh, either other farmers or predatory yeah. banks that sort of prey uh, on this population of black people. It almost sounds like a cartoon villain, yeah. but, it, but it's not <laughs> like at all to this very day. Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do on our show is really treat land as an unspoken character. In fact, I would say that, you know, when we started the show in the first season, I've been with the show since day one, um, none of us had ever been on a show about, you know, black sugarcane farmers. That was, you know, we sort of looked around the writers rooms. Have you ever been on a show about farmers? No. Um, and where we sort of really discovered the series outside of how rich the characters were as a family members, but where we discovered how is this a series for years and years is when we began to put the fact that the land was an unspoken character right in front of us. And as soon as we locked onto that, and we began to dig into the history, we found that there was a TV show where we could highlight um, characters who deal with um, poverty, who deal with trying to be prosperous and deal with a lack of generational opportunity. So it's both in our characters and it's also baked into the cake of our show because it's baked into the history of our country and how our country has treated black farmers with blatant racism. Yeah, I think you're, you're um, spot on in a couple couple ways. One, I, I was listening to a radio conversation discussing uh, President Biden uh, and the, the stimulus of recovery. And there was almost an underlying tone of shock when they used the word black and farmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it was this hero narrative about the small farmer. And it's a hero narrative, I think, that is, has been lack, lacking, you know, the diversity that farming actually represents and the struggle that you discuss. I thought you mentioned two things. I just want to highlight, and then we hopefully can come back to further on. One is the intersectionality that you're discussing, which is government policy that affects farming, the Department of Agriculture setting loans, uh, having embedded in institutional prejudice in those systems. And then I think this also this idea of the struggle that individuals, uh, men, and uh, uh, make. And I think that's an interesting thing that I want to kind of tease out maybe further on. We could again, kind of look at gender maybe as a important intersection uh, point in this conversation. But uh, maybe one, one more, uh, if there's any other person that wants to weigh in on this particular topic of the, mm. I would call it the organic nature of this, this subject coming up or was it something that you planned for? Yeah, I think with, uh, with Hentified, it was definitely baked in, um, in terms of exploring Gentrification in a neighborhood, and specifically hentification, which is the term that was coined in Boyle Heights, um, and, you know, to describe, you know, a process of instead of outsiders coming in and opening businesses and it, it, it changing the neighborhood and erasing the, the history and the culture of a neighborhood, it should be la gente of the neighborhood, the first gen kids, the, the Chicanos in that neighborhood opening businesses and keeping the culture of the neighborhood alive um, and the history, keeping all of that rich. Um, but, you know, then there's there was always... Um, 
so a push and pull within the neighborhood itself because there's uh, uh, you know uh, some some activists uh, um, or networks that would feel like it was still gentrification and still causing displacement of the most at risk, the most uh, uh, low income, undocumented communities that um, don't have that don't own houses that because of redlining, because of the history of redlining, that don't um, have the money to or have the the the, the legal status to be able to. Um, to accrue in my, uh, just wealth in, in, in this country. And so um, it was always such a push and pull. And for us going into the show, what was so, you know, Linda and I are both first gen, our parents were immigrants, were undocumented for a long time. My mom became a citizen just last year for the first time and uh, while we were in the writer's room of the second season. And um, it, it was something that as first generation Americans, as children of immigrants, we, uh, grow up with the um we always joke about it, and we talk about it, we joke about it but it's also like the reality of it is like growing up as children of immigrants we, we grow up with the uh the intense guilt trips of like you we sacrifice everything for you to have an opportunity here to right. to chase that american dream and then to kind of um go and chase that american dream but the further and the harder you chase it and you 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 um aspire and and uh build um the just be trying to be upwardly mobile sure. as as American citizens um, in your family, the further away you get from your culture, from your from where you come from, and and that that the gap that it kind of provides, and being in this middle ground of not being from here, not being from there, and trying to figure out like where exactly do you belong within this within these uh, of the the Venn diagram of being an American and. Um, so it, it was definitely something that was so baked into it and, and what we were trying to explore in the show because what we saw when we looked at it was never necessarily, when it comes to the idea of gentrification, a lot of the times we would always hear, um, oh, well, you know, like, you know, if you can make it, like if you're gonna open a business and you can do it, like, you know, you're, this whole bootstrap mentality of like you, you, you made it and you're doing it. And so like, why is that anybody else's fault versus, you know, and, and essentially kind of putting, profits over people in a sense but we wanted to look at it and explore well like in a, in a lot of ways like there's everybody's right you know in this in this struggle and like people that want to not be impacted and affected and become homeless and, and or be displaced from their homes and and at the same time the people that are like well we're here trying to chase this american dream and trying to chase the opportunities that our parents have sacrificed and and given us and the the opportunity to do things that we couldn't have done in our home countries and so um it, it was this push and pull that we wanted to explore in this 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 gray area of the show and do it through comedy because I think this is such a um, it, it was something that was important to us when we you know you think you brought up poverty porn early on of something that we were Lynn and I were just exhausted of, of like let's make something that for us like our day to day is just our families are hysterical like they're so funny like they crack us up and that's how we get through it <laughs> that's how we get through the the intensity of some of this of the day-to-day -day growing up this way right. and um we wanted to just have a show that reflected that because it's not all just dark and dreary and i got tired of just seeing a lot of you know yeah. mexicans riding in the back of truck down a dusty road um yeah. that image was getting exhausting so um so yeah um no it was definitely always baked in and, and, and had a lot of layers to it that we wanted to unpack yeah, and I think I think the idea of gentrification, like redlining, is is underlying a lot of our conversation, which is there are systems put in place that lead to different repercussions. So we prevent, um, we 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 create policies that shrink the geography that poor people can occupy in environments, and then when it becomes desirable, the same policies push them out. And there is this push and pull. And then the question is political power. And it's always these systems. And there's these hero narratives, like you mentioned about opening a business, you can make it pull up by your bootstraps. But where is the underlying narrative about the repercussions of redlining, et cetera? So I think it's, again, you're teasing that out really, really well. I wanna, um, if I might ask Stephen, um, your show place, takes place uh, during a previous pandemic, the AIDS pandemic. And there are similarities between what the LGBTQ plus community went through. And I wonder what are the similarities, if any, that what we're going through now, and I say we as a, a member of the community, um, the similarities, and I think um, 
you teased it out that time are so relevant to the conversations about the impact of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the most obvious connection is a lack of access to quality healthcare. Um, you know, and there were plenty of reports that showed that, uh, you know, Black and Latin and Afro Latinx folks were the most disenfranchised. And even after uh, vaccines were available or became available, that in those communities, the, the communities that were the most at risk, uh, they, they still didn't have access. Um, and if anything, folks who have plenty of privilege were then traveling to those areas so that they could then siphon uh, resources that specifically were supposed to be for those who were the most um, at risk. And so uh, I think the, the, the difference between what we're seeing today so that's the similarity. I think the difference is, uh, is that we still haven't found the cure for HIV AIDS, you know, there, and, and that I think is, you know, we're how many decades in, and it is, it's still a crisis. It's still eviscerating. Um, I'm gonna speak specifically around the queer and trans communities. And, you know, I think that with distance, I think we've, there's a stinkiness that I have found anyway, especially now working on Pose that uh, I think folks just assume that it's it's not as important, you know, and the reality is that we still really need to be talking about HIV AIDS and we still need to have conversations around uh, safety, especially when we think about, you know, currently LGBTQ youth are 120% more likely to be homeless um, than their straight and cis counterparts. You know, 40% of LGBT, excuse me, 40% of youth um, are LGBTQ identified. And so we really do have to talk about, um, you know, the systems that A, are disenfranchising queer and trans youth, but B, are what is their access to not only medical care, but to employment opportunities, yeah. um, to housing. Um, so I think those are, to go back to your previous question, those were issues that felt salient to myself and to all of my collaborators when talking about and working on really every season of Pose. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you bring up healthcare and if you think about the essentials of life and sometimes life and death, um, you know, healthcare is tied to employment and there are systems with employment and privileged healthcare that is sufficient to meet the needs of communities and people. Uh, it, it doesn't exist necessarily. And then the public processes that we provide it has a paucity of, of generosity, which is just disgusting, which leaves people wanting and struggling just to meet their basic needs like you were talking about. And I think that in the time that it did really talks about that. Yeah, and I, I don't want to um, mire our conversation. Like, I don't want to bring it down with with only speaking about numbers. But um, you know, the the truth is that the trans community, and more specifically, Black trans women, um, are the most disenfranchised community, um, and are the most overlooked. And so, when we're talking about specifically queer and trans people and more specifically black trans women who are the individuals who were highlighting on the show, uh, you know, not having access to employment opportunities, for example, then forces the community to go out and find other avenues to survive, yeah. you know? And so in the case of trans women, more often than not, they turn to sex work. And so survival sex work is one of those ways to survive. Um, you know, and so then again, in talking about not having access to quality healthcare, you know, what then are the possibilities for these women? Um, in addition to continue to unpack that, we've also f criminalized sex work in this country. Yeah. And so, you know, we have all of these women who are living in a country uh, where we're not providing access yeah. Um, to the resources that they need. And then we're also finding a way to criminalize the avenues and the inroads that you're using to survive. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it, it, those, are the, those are the 
issues that we're hoping to highlight on our show. And so outside of the, you know, the, the fun of the ball and, and yeah. the color and, and all the verb that, that we highlight through those moments in the series, uh, you know, if nothing else, I hope that individuals who are tuning in will walk away and at least consider, um, you know, that their role in creating these systems and how we all continue to perpetuate them. Yeah, I think, I think that's something maybe we can see if the audience is interested in, but it's, we talk about the symptoms, but really if, if we want to approach this, the stories you're telling are talking about the systems that are producing these symptoms. And to solve it, it's, it's the, I, we have to tackle it that way. I want to give just two, two pieces of information to the audience. And if someone else wants to weigh in, I have, otherwise I have a couple questions. Linda, you're on deck. But I, um, I want to let folks know two things. One, we're going to go into Q&A in a bit. And if you want to submit your questions, there's a Q&A function that you can go on your Zoom and click that and submit your question there. I'll be selecting questions from there. And then uh, throughout the conversation, as folks raise different topics, uh, we'll be posting resources. I don't want to scroll, but for instance, the last conversation brought up HIV and we have tip sheets and information and resources that you can link to both from an informational and uh, uh, health. So we'll be continuing to do that throughout the conversation as people bring up different topics. So um, unless anyone else wanted to weigh in, I, I had a question I wanted to pose to Linda and Marvin. Um, uh, Linda and Marvin, um, are there ways that you all are planning to address COVID-19 in your upcoming episodes? And how will we see, will we see how it's impacting the Latinx community in terms of what we've been talking about, access to care, uh, financial repercussions? And um, are there any teasers you wanna give us for the shows that you, I think you just wrapped yet. <laughs> We were out this morning at 3 a.m., which right now I'm like, okay, I got to access the smart side of my brain. <laughs> Everyone's so smart sounding. Um, yeah, no, I, I think we had long discussions. Obviously, last summer is when we got picked up for a second season. There was a lot of questions immediately from Netflix and from our producers asking whether or not we were going to address COVID. And, and we were very much exposed to so many community activists and folks in the community that we are um, in contact with who were letting us know about the, the enormous displacement and amount of people who are being left without homes, obviously during this last year, um, disproportionately impacted obviously in black and brown communities, especially here in LA. Um, and so we really thought really deeply about how, whether or not we were gonna address it in the show, we ultimately decided not to. Um, I think because so many of the issues that were be being brought up by this truthfully already existed in the series. And there were issues that only were exacerbated by, by the pandemic. Like it's not, I mean, a lot of folks from, from our communities joke about like, this ain't nothing new for us. <laughs> like we've all been going through this and our communities have been going through this for generations and generations. And so a lot of those themes, those topics, we were already kind of talking about, we already were coming into a heavy season because we, at the end of our first season, our beloved grandfather is detained by ICE. And so we knew we were coming into a season that was already going to have very heavy layers. And for our communities, like Marvin said, we try to talk about our pains through comedy because we want to also leave our communities with joy. Like when they watch our show, we don't want them to walk away feeling broken. We want them to walk away feeling empowered. And so we always write our characters, even if they're talking about these topics that are so difficult from a place of empowerment. So when you saw, if you saw the first season, you saw characters like Javier who yeah. at first you think he's a silly, joking, mariachi who keeps asking for discounts and he's just always joshing people but then by the end you by mid-season you discover that he's actually unhoused with his son and is desperate has been displaced is desperate to find a home and, and suddenly um your idea of him turns on its head and that was a big part of our mission with the show and it continues to be even in the second season so i can't give spoilers but <laughs> i can see that we like continue to try to turn people's stereotypes around for them like without them even realizing it, it's a yeah. big mission for us, for them to sit with characters and fall in love with characters so that when by the end with Pop, for example, we never talk about his status yeah. the entire season. And that was purposeful because that's how we experience it in our communities. When you see it in TV, it's like the day in, day out of like, oh my God, these things that were undocumented, things are so hard and that's not our reality. <laughs> our reality is like, oh yeah, my mom's a document, my grandma's not. like, our reality is we live every day, we come home, we joke, we fuck around. like we live our lives. And so we wanted to show this family 
living their lives, showing them empowered, making you fall in love with, with pop so that by the end, you understand why it's so painful. He's not just another number. He's a guy you love. And, and that's truly how we tell our stories. So yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. You nailed it. I would give okay. that a, a, a little. <laughs> I lost track of my own thoughts, but okay. for a teaser, but uh, maybe Marvin will back you up. Marvin, give me a teaser. Come I on. a teaser. I, what I say, like Linda mentioned, we are dealing with Pop and his immigration journey, um, and you know, there's there's other shows and other movies and plenty, and it's come up so much in the, in the you know, especially during the. Uh, during the 45 era of it all, we, we saw the, the pain of that and we've seen that, you know, and the, what that looks like on, um, on, on one side of the story and, and what we really wanted to concentrate on, I'll say this, is that um, we didn't want to see Pop, we wanted to see a different side of the story that, that I think is a, another um, part of it that we really want to, we want to unpack and to see how it affects an entire family. Yeah. Um, and so just the, uh, the legal journey of, of having to fight and figure out how whether or not he'll be able to stay and, then, and, and that's as, as much as I think I can say but it's it's really um it's the most we've said to this point yeah. because we we feel like this like I'm worried that there's going to be like a sniper dot that shows up uh, uh on our heads at some point if we say too much but <laughs> um but yeah no I think that that's really uh what we're, yeah. we're trying to unpack and how that um that journey of displacement yeah. within the larger context of, of gentrification that's still going on and, and, the, and the small business and trying to make that survive yeah. um, the way that it, it affects everybody, the ripple effects of it. I love that. And I love what you said that, um, Linda, that um, we are not a collection of tragic things that happen to us, right? We're, we're ups and downs and the positives and uh, those living in, yeah. in poverty of income still have great lives and, and families and loves and, and struggles doesn't negate that. And that really resonates yeah. with me. My, uh, when you said that, it really, it made a lot of sense to me. And I don't know that people think that way. Go ahead, Linda. No, and I, I was just going to add, it's one of the things that Marvin and I always talk about very publicly, I often say I'm low income. I represent folks who were low income, like not anymore. Now I have a show and all this stuff, right? But for most of my life, I was, I grew up, you know, low income and, and like, I say it very proudly and I speak of it very loudly because I think there's so much stigma around being poor. 100%. And whether or not we have access to things like this, like industry, yeah. things like this is like, that's a big part of it too. Like us saying we're low income is not only for ourselves, it's so that folks who are coming up in the industry who have come from those backgrounds know that they can be here too. And that they yeah. that there are people who've been in their position who are now doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I would, I would just echo that. I think it's a coming out, you know, in a different way. Um, yeah. walk around and there's so much shame with poverty. I think the stories you're telling and that we're talking about today is how do we negate and hopefully tell a more beautiful, complicated narrative. Anthony, were you going to say something there? No. I, I was thinking of saying, <laughs> saying something, basically just um, uh, underscoring uh, what Linda is talking about. I think um, class and poverty is a um, is sort of a quiet, you know, people's back is sort of a quiet force in the entertainment industry. I feel like people, yeah. uh, I think the term you just, you know, almost have to come out about the fact that they are not from upper middle class and above backgrounds. Uh, that is certainly my own story being from the south side of Chicago vis-a-vis -vis Mississippi. Um, that because I was also well-educated, was able to sort of hide the fact that I, um, you know, you know, son of a large family with a single mother and, and, and all of that and understand what it is like to, uh, particularly during the 80s and early 90s, open the refrigerator and have an echo, you know, meet you. And so, you know, they're funny thing, you know, it's sort of funny people who know me or work with me or for me, you know, like they gave me, my staff gave me a uh, Red Lobster uh, um, um, uh, uh, gift card for, for Christmas because they know that I like, love going to those places because I could not afford yeah. to go to those places Chili's. when I, not on a regular basis anyway, yeah. when I was growing up. And so I've, like many people have had, 
you know, um, experiences in Hollywood where you get into television or whatever, and everyone thinks you're supposed to go to La Chorée every night. And I'm like, like, no, I'm, I'm kicking it over here and I'm good with that. And it makes me happy. And it, it's funny that it's a funny thing because there is this assumption, you know, about, uh, about what poverty looks like. And for a lot of people, the fact, again, that I was well-educated and in one school and all this stuff didn't look like what they thought poverty looked like. And in fact, I was well acquainted with uh, being part of the working poor for a very, very long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I, I wanna put you on TV. Oh, wait, and uh, have you uh, personally screamed that. Um, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in so many conversations in Los Angeles about homelessness and people use phrases like clean it up. And I find that morally reprehensible and uh, just dehumanizing a whole people that are of every shade. And uh, so many of us either were there or came damn close mm -hmm. and we lose our empathy. And I think by the stories you tell, we hopefully gain, as you were saying, Linda, the narrative, you know, undocumented, beautiful family, working his life, doing his thing, struggles and joys. Uh, we gain that empathy to hopefully manifest in a way that changes systems in my mind. Um, I wanna pose a question to, everyone um, uh, that's very meaningful to me. Um, one in six kids in the United States live in poverty. And poverty, as far as I'm concerned, is ill-defined. It's too generous as far as I'm concerned. I bet it's more than that if we really looked at it. Yet we rarely see this portrayed in entertainment. Um, how do we do better there? And why is it absent? And I, I would open that up to anyone who had a kind of um, a point of view on that or, or uh, a refinement. You go, Erica, I see you un unmuted, go for it. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, because doing that does like this, it becomes an indictment mm -hmm. um, of us yeah. uh, as mm -hmm. a society when the people wow. who are the least uh, able to take care of themselves by dent of their age yeah. are struggling. It's your fault. Yeah. And nobody wants to see that unless it's like a fun little popper story where suddenly, you know, like a little princess, you know, those Shirley Temple movies, suddenly yeah. somebody wealthy comes in, along and, and helps them out and we're all excited and happy about that. But, you know, in a, in a, in a movie, for example, like Moonlight, where, you know, he wants a bubble bath and he has to boil water to get himself some hot water you know it's this beautiful image but baked into a beautiful image is the horror that this child does not have hot water running hot water mm -hmm. in his home uh but it is an indictment thing that's all i'm saying yeah i to in your question of like how do we do more or why do we not have i think uh you know the thing that first thing that came to mind for me is in line with everything we've just been talking about is there's I think I, I, I continuously experience it anytime we're talking about the show or when we're around people, or even on sometimes on the crew, just having casual conversations and, and or in post or just like kind of the, the, the it's that opinion. I, I sometimes I hear this, the, the little comments and they, they, that around what poverty looks like or feels like, or, or the opinion that people have or the image that they have unconsciously, you know, that bias that they have against what it is to be poor, even from people that maybe grew up, you know, low income. Um, I, I think it, it still comes out. And I guess, you know, what I'm trying to get to is like, you know, even with how Linda and I with making the show, like we struggle with like, are we like, how do we balance this? How do we one, not make trauma porn or poverty porn, but then also, uh, but also honor who we are and how we came up and how we grew up and, and do it in a way that's fun and that is lively and that is um, that is proud. And I remember like Linda, like, you know, you always, you talk about that story when, you're, when your mom first watched the show and you were like, there was something that we were trying to make something we hadn't been seen yet, which was just something that felt so, so, so specific and authentic to our upbringing and how we grew up and that to have characters that spoke the way that we spoke. Um, and, and not just our, the ones that are like ourselves, the first gen kids, but the immigrant, the parents, and being able to see older generation characters who are just as whip smart and funny and lively as like the younger uh, cast. Um, and 
I remember you know your your mom always talking you that comment that you made about your mom uh, watching it for the first time and feeling like oh like you know it feels like the show isn't afraid or sh ashamed of themselves mm -hmm. yeah, of being Mexican. Yeah, she was like, we were in New York because I took him on a, 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 our press tour with my, my mom and my, my brothers because they had never been to New York before and they had seen some episodes and my mom's like, this is the first time I've seen something where like, I see working, I mean, she said in her words, right, working class communities and it looks like us and it feels like us and I could tell whoever, <laughs> it was weird because she was talking to me, but she's like, I could tell whoever made it wasn't afraid or ashamed of being poor. They weren't ashamed of who they were. They weren't ashamed of being like Mexican, but like really Mexican. They weren't, weren't ashamed of it. And I just like, you know, that filled my whole heart because that was exactly like what we were trying to do. Cause I think there's this narrative within our community sometimes of like, we can't tell stories of the poorest in our community. Like some, you'll hear the narrative, like, I don't want to see gardeners. I don't want to see maids. And I'm like, I don't want to see one dimensional gardeners or one dimensional maids. My aunts were maids, <laughs> my family are grown, and my people, I, my people have done those things. And I want to see three dimensional representations of them. I want to see how funny they are. I want to see how they live right. their lives in three dimensional ways. And I think that that's, you know, I, when you think of, and I'm coming back to the children, when you think of like children and seeing them, that was, again, I'll go back to like why we, the Javier Danny episode. Mm -hmm. You show Danny like having this huge crush on this girl the whole time and you fall in love with this little boy and at the end you find out that he's homeless. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of it for us. It was, it's like, we're not going to lead with the thing that you've been mm -hmm. used to seeing of this community, but we're also going to let you know that this is what's happening. This is what's happening yeah. in the Heights every day. Why are we ignoring it? Why are we going to be ashamed of it and, and all talk about how we're not going to put that in the media. We're not going to represent ourselves that way. And it's like, so you're just going to erase that part of our community. And yeah. like, we're just not about that. We, we want to spotlight that part of our community and get, do it in a way that's loving and, yeah. and beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, Kate, in the center, I always think about it as infotainment, that you just can't turn it off. And at the same time, you know, the curtain gets pulled back, not only on your mind, but your heart. And uh, it's that reinforcement of, your, of our best selves, I think. Um, um, briefly, I wondered- David? Uh, yeah, please. Can I just, I just want to say one thing, just because yeah. I feel like it would be remiss if I didn't, which is, I think that, well, I want to bring up just two quick points. One is that every single person as a creator and as a showrunner on this panel is a person of color. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just think that that's important to know in terms of like, who's, who feels the responsibility yeah. to tell these stories. Um, but beyond that, I also think, and, and you know, folks can take this for what it is. Like if it, it's an indictment of, the, of our community, then that's just what it is. But the reality is we have to take a look at who the gatekeepers are and why more of these stories aren't being told. So I don't know that it's as simple as people aren't telling the story, um, which that isn't what anybody here has, has said. But I think there's a lot of rhetoric as to why we're not seeing particular kinds of stories being told. And the truth is that they're not being told because the gatekeepers aren't allowing for those stories to be right. told. They're not green lighting those stories. They're not bringing us into the room so that we can pitch those stories. Those stories are not making it to air. And so I think if, if our gatekeepers were, um, if they felt called, if they felt a responsibility, I think if they felt there was value in telling these yeah. narratives, then we would see more of them. Yeah, no, those are great points. I mean, those, yeah. yes. And, and when you were talking about the second point, Stephen, I was thinking of systems again. You know, what are the systems that are disenfranchising folks in different ways? But also what you were saying is the gatekeepers in, in a big way are a part of a larger system that determines representation and uh, the ability to be visible, which determines other things. Very I mean, excellent point. Thank you for speaking up. Um, just one, I wanna ask one final question. I have a couple of questions in Q and A, but Ricky, um, I, I wanted to ask uh, just briefly, we've, we've all spoken today about poverty in different ways. And I think we have a um, collective intuitive sense of it, but just for our own edification, but also the people who are participating today, how, how do we define poverty or how, what is a, maybe a, a definition of poverty that we could think of going into the final part of our conversation today, which might help us kind of tease out um, opportunities in our own minds and lives. This is something we've talked to Erica a lot about and all the other people who do research in this space. Nobody uses the same definition, partly because it's afforded by the data that we can access and what other people think is poverty. 
the way that we have thought about poverty and when we when we think about all the stories relevant to poverty, mm-hmm. it's literally every story that we encounter in our lives that tells us anything about who is poor, who is not poor, mm-hmm. what those people are like on either side and how you move between them. Mm-hmm. And it's surprising. It's, it is not common in entertainment media in particular, but you saw it popped actually for several different kinds of shows, several different shows. Um, in December, we get most of our information about that, most of our stories and most of our like eyeball, screen eyeball time yeah. about it comes from the news on TV and online. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a, a good answer, which is the answer is, is broad and uh, it's defined by different mechanisms. I wanna go to the questions in the Q&A and uh, these are not necessarily addressed to everybody, but I, I would love uh, folks to just weigh in as they see themselves adding. Um, the question, first question is from Michael Lopez, who's asking, how do we see food as a tool to highlight the deficiencies in mainstream narratives of poverty and share what is possible in our communities and spur action? Yeah, I think food, food is a very interesting topic and it's come up a number of times. I wonder if anyone wants to take a stab at that first. Well, I guess we, we have the show about a taco shop, so maybe we should, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, the, the food in the show was so, you know, um, integral to like just the intersection of so many different topics that we were exploring, like not just gentrification, the appropriation of culture, um, you know, business and, and um uh, and, and just trying to make a livelihood and, you know, with the, the, the price of the tacos and who, who deserves to eat, you know, and pay this much for these tacos and like, who is this actually made for? Um, it, it presented a way for us to kind of, to center our, and kind of create like a, a funnel that we could put all the questions that we were asking through. Um, and, um, and I think more than anything, like, you know, in doing this show now for six years and exploring gentrification and Boyle Heights and not just in Boyle Heights, but just like this is an issue that is happening in just so many major cities around the world, not just in the U.S. Like it's just such a prevalent issue that is just getting more and more, um, uh, uh, becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, um, and we, in in those six years, like every time we would ask questions and we're coming to those questions and figure, you know, learning more questions to ask, like the thing that we've come to realize is that there's never any fucking answers mm-hmm. to like how to fix this or how what's going to happen or how do we make this better or how do we what what is going to be the thing that can that can help keep people in their homes and or or, or fight the displacement and and um, and. Um, I think that, you know, when you're asking the questions like what is possible in our communities and how do we spur action, I, a, a lot of, I think, of our, our approach in making this show and in telling this story and through all the different characters is that we, we wanted to just pose a lot of the questions and we wanted to unpack them and we made sure what we saw in, in all the debates that we would have in the room and then as we were going through it is that we were seeing that everybody had a point like everybody tends to come and let's say no we just tried to approach it where like nobody's wrong like we just like let's have the conversation and we wanted to pose all the questions and create enough characters that had strong points of view um which is just fucking drama right like it's just storytelling it's like if you're doing it well like everybody should have a strong point of view and should come into it and like so that there's conflict and but you know being able to do it through this very specific and important issue that was near and dear to our hearts, we wanted to um, we wanted to make sure that people would watch it and no matter what point of view they were coming in it from, they could find somebody to latch onto that they were like that's how I feel about this and then challenge them. Um, and even if you came in thinking like oh this shows for me and this is about my point of view a bit, but they're like yeah but we're gonna challenge you too on this. You know even though Linda and I have our opinions that very much sway one way. Um, we still, in Linda and I, just as part, writing partners, constantly will have arguments and like not agree. And I'm like, it's fine. We're just going to put this conversation into the show because uh, I'm not going to convince you. You're not going to convince me. We'll put it in the show and the audience will tell you that I'm right. And uh, it, it's how we tend to handle it. But, um, but yeah, so we would just try to put those questions in as much as possible and have everybody debate it because we don't want to create, we didn't want to create um, what's the the after school special where we have a neat, neat clean uh, package. I think what we just wanted to challenge people to, to walk away and hopefully, especially when it comes to 
gentrification, people tend to be like, oh, it, it happened, change happens. It's something that we hear so often. Like mm -hmm. change happens and it's inevitable and, and don't question the, the, the systems that are in place. Don't question the way that they participate in the system or um, whether even if you are from a low income community, like they, we're, not, we're not questioning how we participate sometimes and how it affects our neighbors and mm -hmm. our community. And so um, we our, our biggest hope was always that we're like, hopefully we can just plant a few seeds and plant a few questions in the back of people's heads as they watch that they can walk away and feel like, oh, like I, I can all look at this a little bit differently the next time I encounter it in my life. I think you really fluidly move between food and gentrification because they share that, I think, systemic uh, underpinning. Um, Anthony, he talked about planting seeds. I wonder, any, you know, food as a narrative, where does it come from? How is it? Who's making it? Who has access to it? Right. You know, when the question popped up in the, the chat, I was, I, I think it brought me back to what you were saying at the, at the start of the conversation about the, the narrative that you're trying to tell and the struggle that they're going through uh, to maintain their business. I, I, I think food maybe it meant differently in the question, but I don't know if you had any thoughts about the representation of food uh, as a narrative tool in this space. Um, I would say that for us on Queen Sugar, food probably serves a couple of different functions, uh, two of which is one, the production of some sort of food, in this case, sugar, but using that as a larger sort of metaphorical um, sort of representation of other crops as well. Sometimes our farmers are also growing soybeans and other things like that on their land. Um, so number one, the production of food, and then also food as, uh, as a touchstone for the community is huge for us and our show, huge, 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 huge. Um, and so in a way, how do we use food um, in a rural community for people who don't have much money, but who get to show their creativity through food and their ability to um, you know, use food to bring people together uh, is something that's huge for us. But in terms of the systemic piece, the production of food um, is something that we definitely deal with a lot. You know, one of the things I was thinking about um, is sort of the connection between the limitations and the systemic sort of forces that are pushing against people, black people in rural spaces and also black people in urban spaces. And so when Erica earlier was talking about uh, redlining and, you know, which is to limit the financial options that uh, working class people and black people have uh, and brown people have um, in urban spaces. And then you have the bank forces on black people <laughs> in, in rural spaces. And then also there's a question of who works in those farms, right? Which is some, some uh, uh, narratives, um, uh, you know, of undocumented people uh, that we have tried to also um, integrate into our show. And then we've also tried to talk about how institutional forces and dramatize how institutional forces uh, can be represented themselves by people of color as well on other people of color <laughs> and how privilege comes in that way. Um, and so food sort of becomes this thing that can sort of uh, spider out uh, in terms of being this force for good, in terms of bringing people together, but also the limitations of institutional forces. Again, banks come to mind primarily um, and how it impacts who can grow food, who can profit from food um, uh, as well. So it's, it's a multi-layered thing um, that, you know, I could probably spend all day <laughs> sort of teasing out. <laughs> You know, if you think about, we talked about healthcare, we talked about these different issues, and I think, you know, food is a common theme to express poverty. Either it's people mm -hmm. eating junk food because of right. that quarantine or access or whatever the, the lark is that's that's mm -hmm. used to mm -hmm. uh, demonize people. But I, I And shame that, people a lot. If And, you know, I have myself experienced that as well as others, you know, the idea that, and if for some reason, food seems to be this thing that people think that they can comment on. Yeah. to other people with abandon, without any sort of thought about the class implications, the implications of economic resources being a part of that. And it, it becomes this sort of free for all way. I hear people doing it all the time 
you know, you eat badly, you eat junk food, just like you were just sort of saying, you do this, you do that. And not sort of thinking themselves about, well, what is it that allows you to shop at Whole Foods if that's where you primarily shop? Um, you know, so. Well, I think the abandoned comment is true. I think it's acceptable, but it's also proxy probably for underlying, you know, uh, other isms, whatever those mm -hmm. isms are. Right. Um, I have a question I want to throw out to maybe Stephen, you can kick us off. I think it's a great question. Uh, uh, building up Anthony's comment about systems and looking at it from a food lens, but you, you uh, made a comment about gatekeepers and Nicole asks, uh, speaking to the point made on gatekeepers, not green lighting stories, who are these people? Networks, um, question mark. And for any funders or those in philanthropy listening to this conversation, what is the best way to help these stories get out? I think maybe, um, We'll leave the funder one aside for a moment and just maybe Stephen, if you could kick us off, if you have thoughts as to um, explain who these folks are to this rather powerful assemblage we have listening in today. I mean, it's, it's primarily, it's the studios, it's the networks, it is the executives who, you know, the five of us as, as storytellers have to pitch our ideas to, um, you know, the, the truth is that Hollywood is still a male dominated, let's just be really specific, a white, straight, cisgendered, male dominated industry, you know? And so if you look at the five of us, <laughs> you know, we don't check those boxes. And so there's a additional, uh, there's all this labor that we all have to do when we get into a room to convince folks that our stories have value, especially when those stories that we're pitching are also centering narratives of people who look just like us, you know? And so it isn't by chance that you're not seeing on television a, a, a dearth of stories that center women or, or maybe more specifically, I should say black or Latinx or Asian women, um, why you're not seeing a ton of LGBTQ plus IA content, you know, why you're not seeing more folks of color um, on your television screens. You know, I think we're really quick as an industry to pat ourselves on the back and, you know, sure, you know, we're seeing more yeah. today than we were, you know, five years ago, but the reality is our airwaves, especially where we're, where, you know, I think last year there were over 500 pieces of original scripted content. Um, and at this point you can turn in any direction and see a new network being built. Um, it's fascinating to me that we're still in a place where what we're seeing on our television screens and on streaming networks and on our computers still is not reflective of the world that we live in. Right. Can I, I just wanna unpack one, one word you used and see what, see what you say. So you said that our stories have value and I think people interpret value differently. You know, when you first said it, I thought to myself money because this conversation is poverty. I was thinking to myself, okay, how do I kind of, mm. you know, uh, ingest that into the dialogue? But I think, value has kind of just so many levels to it you know there are values there is a value to it and then there is a monetary and i wondered if you just would kind of unpack what you were saying with regards to uh when you get in the room or the rooms or the zooms and you're pitching how do you interplay those i think of three maybe there's uh, more but how do you interplay those is you talked about the responsibility of the airways I mean, yeah. it's really a public responsibility if you have the broadcast license to operate the public interest and this could be that. But how has it become, well, I, th Go ahead. I think what you're asking is, is a really, it's an interesting and unique question because the reality is that, you know, everything is sort of rooted in capitalism. And so the reality is that we've found a way to monetize the human experience. Like that's ultimately what we do. So I, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm playing within the system and I recognize that and I'm, I'm acknowledging it by saying that, but it's tough because in the case of a pose, for example, where we're looking at the lives of queer and trans, black and brown people whose lives really we know have no value. And especially at the time that I was prepping to, to pitch the show, and certainly once we went to air, as Marvin pointed out earlier, we were in the midst of that last super fraudulent uh, administration. You know, it's like, it's tough then to have to how do you prove to groups of people who have 
either no working knowledge of a particular community or really just don't see any. And again, I, when I say value, I mean like values, not monetary value, but yeah. don't see any value in a particular person's life or in a particular person's story. Um, you know, and then on top of that, the added layer is, and how do we then monetize the narrative? Yeah. And so that's really, that's hard. And so occasionally, like there's always going to be the outliers, right? Yeah. So you'll have those stories that somehow eke through and then ultimately they do well, right? And so I think, and I don't wanna call anybody out, but I think yeah. if you look back in the last like five years, let's say, we've seen a massive proliferation of specifically black content. The reality is that some of those shows though, and I'll, like, I'll point out one, for example, like in Atlanta, which I think is great, we share a network. Similarly, I think it's not like we're a huge ratings bonanza and, and really neither is, is Atlanta either. If you compare it to like what folks on the networks are doing, yeah. right? And so those numbers are smaller. And so the value that that then has for the network isn't going to be, it's, it's not as rich, right? Yeah. But a show like Atlanta, for example, is a critic's darling and it wins a slew of Emmy awards, yeah. right? And so then now we found a way to attach value to this narrative outside of just the importance of having a black writer's room and yeah. a black man who's written, created, directed, and is starring in his own show. You know, similarly with like an Issa Rae, it's like those, sh those shows, maybe are not the best example because they happen to be really great shows, yeah. um, but it's also important, even if they were bad shows, visibility is important. It's critically important for young people to turn on a television and to see their story reflected. And I think, you know, it, I'm thinking specifically about like Hentified with, with Linda and Marvin, which is, I'm imagining it would have, it might have been, I don't know this to be the case, but you know, they're coming up on the heels of Vida, which was on stars, which also was dealing with this, this theme of Hentification. And so I'm imagining for them, there was this added work that they had to do to prove that their show had value because there was already a show on television that was telling that a, a similar story or at least was playing in a similar sandbox. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of work that we all have to do that our white straight male counterparts don't have to worry about. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 the, that's exactly why I wanted to prod it because I think it's such an important point is there is a system in place that has a, uh, that represents a disproportionate amount of power on one side and the other. And there is, I would say a poverty on one side that is not a lack of quality or, or depth of, of stories to tell, but is an imbalance in power. Um, we are close to that time and I wanna ask the panelists to briefly uh, share any final thoughts they had. Um, I don't wanna put anyone on the spot, but um, I'm also really mean at the alphabetical order, but if, if anyone would like to go first with some final thoughts from our panelists about the topic today, which to bring us back is Money Matters, changing the story of poverty prosperity and opportunity. I, I'll just say, I think, you know, for all the writers out there working on this and even if your show isn't primarily dealing with poverty or dealing with class, um, when you're writing, I just wanna say like, please, like when you're writing characters that are of a of a underrepresented in poverty uh, uh, lower class or you know, um, or lower income rather, um, please just write them like you would any other character. Just like make them as interesting. Give them the best lines. Like please, just give them give them better lines than your leads. Like just make them fun. Make them good. Make like I, I guess I just want to like see that more often because I think that that's something that Lynn and I like. Um, one of the things that we've done so much of that we try to and that we try to focus on in the show is like any side character like there's no every side character could be the lead yeah. every side character every background character could be the hero of their story yeah. and I think that that's the philosophy that we try to approach it from and um, that stories they just benefit from just better stories that way so yeah. um, and, and it's how I think we fight and push the you know away from stereotypes and from um, yeah. images that are just kind of at this point played out. Thank you. Right, we'll just leave that. That's great. Anyone else want to weigh in? We don't have to hear from everybody, but I wanted to give the chance if 
there's some final thoughts. I thought it was great that he addressed the fact that we're talking to a room full of people that are like yourselves in some way storytellers. And this is a chance to maybe message something you've learned or experienced or want to ask them to do uh, to learn. Again, I just remind folks there are resources in the chat area for topics that have been brought up. But any final thoughts from anyone else that wanted to share? I just want to reiterate what Stephen was saying about value. I'm just still sitting with what you said, Stephen, because it's so real. Like the, if there are people, I mean, I know there's mostly writers who are watching this, but if there are folks who come across this who are gatekeepers, really understanding the definitions of, of value that Stephen just described, because even now I'm I'm taking that in right now because I'm like the things that we've experienced and that I know other creators have experienced in terms of what value means. That's such an important conversation I think we, we need to start having because the old ways and systems of calculating what is a hit um, have to be analyzed because they're all um, saturated in unjust systems, like all of them. And to expect our series by creators of color, marginalized communities to perform in certain ways and not account for that mm -hmm. is crazy. So I think like okay. really opening up that conversation, I'm like so grateful you brought that up, Stephen, because I do feel like that's you can't just have a, it's a, the conversation around diversity programs. You can't just have a program and then just hope for the best. It's like, we got to get in the nitty gritty of like, what is really happening? You could green light yeah. series, but if you're not creating an environment that's going to allow them to flourish, yeah. then what are you really doing at the end of the day? You know, it's not charity. We're not here to be your charity cases. Yeah. Like everyone here is extremely talented and, and powerful in what they do and the work that they're creating. And so I think networks and, and studios and all that have to um, keep that in mind as they're doing the work with, with folks in the community. So, yeah. yeah. Maybe one more before we're, uh, we're a little over time. Uh, Erica, please. I, uh, two quick things. The first is uh, we need to stop using um, cis hetero white males as the default, because um, uh, that plays into this. Uh, you don't see our humanity because you don't see yourself and it's like, no, our stories are just as universal as anyone else's stories. Uh, the second one is, uh, uh, it just completely went out of my head. It's gonna be great though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 okay, oh God. Um, oh, uh, when talking, uh, all of us need to just remember that we all exist in a capitalist society and in a capitalist society, this is a soft capitalist society. This is more oligarchical at this point with like strains <laughs> of capitalism as a part of it. Yeah. Uh, there's always going to be somebody at the bottom. There's always, always going to be somebody at the middle and there are always people going to be at the top. Yeah. And so uh, just remember that it's by design, yeah. <laughs> the way that we are living. There's always going to be some people at the bottom and the middle at the top. Uh, whether or not you feel that you are not on the bottom has nothing to do with whether or not you are actually on the bottom. So it's important that we relay those stories and also talk about the fact that there is just sort of designed that there are always people that are going to be striving. So we need to sort of also include them in the conversation. Absolutely. I love the, I love the word striving as opposed to other descriptions, which are, are more kind of based in tragic. Um, so uh, we're a little over time. I wanna thank the panel. I wanna thank our uh, brilliant researchers there's a lot of resources available in the chat area. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Kate Fold with the Norman Lear Center. And uh, thank you all so much. Kate, uh, back to you, thanks. Maybe not. Yeah, no, I just sure. was muted. <laughs> thank you, David. See, didn't I tell you he's gonna be an amazing moderator? Um, Thank you to all of our panelists, to David for uh, managing the conversation. I think this could go on for another couple of hours, but I know that uh, Marvin and Linda haven't slept, so we're gonna let them go, go to bed soon. But uh, thank you again, this was a fascinating conversation. The research was great. Um, and to answer the question about uh, people in philanthropy and how they can reach television writers and showrunners, well, that's why Hollywood Health and Society exists. So feel free to reach out to us. We are working with uh, writers, producers, and even some of those network executives. Um, and we're sad David's leaving because he was one of the good guys, um, but we're working with them on a daily basis to uh, 
encourage accuracy around these kinds of stories and, and more prominence and so forth. So please um, reach out and writers again, reach out to us. We're happy to connect you with these experts and others in the, in the fields that you're writing stories about. And our services are free to the entertainment industry. So with that, um, lastly, uh, before you log off, a survey is going to pop up for those who are in the audience. If you'd be so kind as to fill it out, it's just a couple of questions to let us know what you thought about today's discussion and, uh, and if you are looking for additional resources. Um, thank you again, David. Thank you to all our panelists, our researchers, and uh, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well. Have a good night, everyone.